Good. Good. All right. Uh, shalom, shalom. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to give all praises to the Most High. Say, Kahalal Yahweh, Bahashem, Hamashiach Yahweh Shah. That's all praises to the Most High God, real name Yahweh, in the name of His only begotten Son, Hamashiach Yahweh Shah. All right, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ as Officer Ram from Yahweh's camp, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, of course, we want to give um, honors to the elders at Yahweh's camp and all the elders that's uh, spreading this truth in truth and sincerity. Uh, to the to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, to the four corners of the earth. Of course, uh, to all the brothers that's pushing this word um, in truth and sincerity. Um, you know, all praises to the Most High for brothers go out there and teaching this word. And of course, want to give um, a shout out to the sisters, the Aqua, that's also um, doing this work at home and taking care of the families and, and rearing up the children in truth and sincerity as well. All right. So with that being said, I want to give all praises uh, to Yahweh uh, for just... Um, giving me some uh, some insight and some revelation and insight on certain things and topics and things like that. And I kind of want to get into, um, you know, love for the brother, love love for your brothers, love for, um, you know, uh, uh, Israelites, your sisters, your brothers, um, and then also salvation, topics on salvation and repentance, things like that. Uh, just because, you know, we understand in this truth what, what salvation deeply entails. And then we also understand, uh, you know, what it means to be salvation and, you know, how you have to work for salvation. Um, you know, the Christian church, I mean, adjust this real quick. The Christian church has this doctrine of once saved, always saved, um, which is not biblically accurate. It's not biblically sound, right? And, um, you know, they also have a preconceived notion on what love for the brother is and what love looks like. So, um, you know, with us being in camps, us being in the truth, us going out there on the highways and byways, uh, you know, we got we to gotta continue to stay in this faith and continue to do the work just because uh, there's people out there, there's groups out there like your Christians that are also doing work, but it's not uh, according to the to the mindset. It's not according to this word. It's not according to this Bible. All right. So I want to get a few precepts um, as you know, before I get started, um, I want to get Matthew 22 and nine. This is red letter. It says, so Yahweh Shai says, go ye therefore into the highways. All right. So. Yahweh Shai gave a commandment, an order for our brothers to go out there on the highways, right? He didn't say go into, uh, you know, all these buildings and erect churches and erect uh, established monuments and make buildings. He said, go out to the highways, right? And as many as you shall find. So it's not like we're just doing work and we're just trying to do work for one brother, two brothers or one sister, two sisters. He says, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage, right? So there's a wedding invitation. I always say this. It's a wedding invitation, and you have your name on it if you're obedient, if you come with the right garments, right? If you come with the, with the obedience and keeping these laws, statutes, and commandments, right? Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find. And the highways is where our people are mostly sick, right? You see, the highways where our people are mostly sick, the, our people are mostly in need, of this word, right? We got to come out to the people. We got to come out there where the uh, where the people are sick. When you look at when you look at the, uh, the the war mindset, right? When you go to war, the medics aren't always in the hospital. I'm gonna say that again, right? The medics, the guys that's taking care of wounds and gunshot wounds, when they was doing, uh, you know, when you look at some of these movies, man. Uh, you see the medic right alongside the infantry, right? Just in case someone got hurt on the battlefield, you can dress the wound and 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 take care of that individual right there on the spot. Sometimes the medics, sometimes the physicians got to go out there where war is at, man. The, you, sometimes these people don't, our people don't have time to come right back to the medic or to the hospital or the infirmary to get healed. Sometimes the people got to go out there and and take care of the sick right there on the spot, right? Um, and so when you go further in that in that scripture, man, it, it goes into having a, a proper garment. What it means to have a proper garment, and, and that's that's the clothing. That's the clothing, the immortal clothing uh, that we have to take off, or we have to put on the immortal clothing and take off the mortal clothing, right? That's those garments. That's those those clean uh, those clean uh, garments that it talks about in Ecclesiastes. Uh, nine and eight, right? So 
We go out there. This is why we go out there to, on the highways and byways. This is why we out there on the streets. This is why we out there uh, um, on these corners every Saturday, right? And every Friday nights, right? Because we got to find as many as we shall find. And this is what it talks about. This is brotherly love right there. Let me get Acts 2 and 38 as well, right? Let me get the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Because people might say, well, why do they go out there on the streets? Why are they out in front of the clubs? Why are they out there... Um, you know, and these places where people gather, do they want to be seen? No, we're out there because our people need actual help. And the only way you're going to find these people, right? The only way you're going to find our people is being out there on the streets. And what's, and what are we teaching, right? Are we teaching to just, you know, tell people off because we upset, right? Are we upset because you know, people think, oh, they got felonies on their records, right? There's a preconceived notion about brothers on the streets with fringes on that we're uh, uh, irresponsible men, right, so to speak. We're men out there that's making children irresponsibly. We got felonies. You know, some of us have had felonies. Some of us have, have had uh, situations where we were, um, you know, uh, in, in a situation where we were um, doing bad things, man, not keeping these laws, statutes, and these commandments. But then we've converted Right. We've converted. And that, this is what makes us relatable. This is why we're relatable when we go out there and teach, because I can get down with my brother and say, I've been here. I've been there. I've done this. I've done that. No one ever said that they were living their whole life perfect. But there's a conversion process. There's a cleansing process, which is why I want to get Acts 2 and 38. This is the book of Acts, the second chapter, the 38th verse. Then Peter said unto them, repent. So what are we out there telling our people to do? To repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahweh Shai, Hamashiach, for the remission of sins. So what are we, our message is to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ or Hamashiach Yahweh Shai, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is our whole duty on why we're out there. You're not going to find us. So we've got to go out there and be fishermen. We got to go out there and actually fish and bid to the marriage and tell our people to repent and be baptized. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as our Lord, our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Right? That's what we are here telling our people to do. And this is all love right here. The problem is the Christian establishments have made up a way on how you use the Bible to show love. Right? The Christian establishment have made it their business to tell you how to love people. But they don't go by the word. This is, this is Proverbs 27 and 5. Right? It's a classic right here. Proverbs 27 and 5. You want to show love to somebody? You tell them to their face, man. Hey, you shouldn't be whoring out that daughter of Zion. You shouldn't be having hatred towards your brother. Put the fornication down, right? No adultery, bro. Put the blunt out. Put the bottle down. Study the word. This is love right here. This is Proverbs 27 and 5, right? It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Open rebuke. So if I rebuke you openly, it's better than me telling you you're doing the right thing secretly. These are two extremes. Open rebuke. Now, it's not saying um, go out there and always rebuke uh, uh, openly and tell every No, no. We go one-on-one. -on -one. Hamashiach tells you, you go one-on-one -on -one with your brother and you say, hey, bro, between me and you, I don't think you should be indulging in this lifestyle. Hey, sis, I don't think you should be indulging in this lifestyle, right? But we're going to rebuke openly, and that's love right there. It's actually better than secret love, right? I'm going to read it again. Open rebuke is better than secret love. So when we go out there and we rebuke, we're showing love to our people. Unfortunately, our own people are not uh, uh, privy, right? It's, it doesn't sit well with them when we go out there and tell them that they're doing wrong. Right. When we go out there and we tell people, hey, get ready for the marriage. But in order to get ready, you got to come back and put away the things that's weighing you down. These weights that's weighing you down. Right. Fornication, uh, lust, uh, uh, homosexuality, uh, uh, being possessed by different spirits. That's not for the most high.
put them away fast, cleanse yourself and be ready to come back into the marriage. Because if you come to the marriage with the wrong garments on, they're going to throw you in the fire. That's what Hamashiach said. I'm going to go to verse six. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? So it may hurt. These words I tell you may hurt. I'm, it may hurt when I tell you you're going off. We may have to come into an argument. We may have to go into actual physical blows if it gets to that, right? But those are faithful wounds. That is better, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, right? So when your pastor tells you the choir, the choir director can be a homosexual, right? These are the, these are the, uh, the this is, um, it says the kisses of an enemy because the enemy allows you to stay in sin, the enemy won't tell you you're going off in the, in the black community, right? And even in the Hispanic community, whatever, we got a term call it. We call it keeping it 100, keeping it a buck. And we pride ourselves on keeping it a buck. We pride ourselves as a nation of people on being uh, real with each other. But when it comes to this Bible, then it's a different story. Nobody wants it to be real. Nobody wants you to tell me I'm going off. Don't tell me, Right. Well, excuse me. We go out there and teach one of the main kickbacks we get is only God can judge me. The Bible don't say that. Right. The Bible don't say that. There's a book called Judges. Right. So so I don't want to go into that. But but the whole idea is our people do not want to accept correction. And this is the this is the plight that the black man has to go through when he's out there teaching the word of God. The plight of the black man when he teaches the word of God is, you know, other people won't accept you because of the color of your skin. Your own people will deny you because of how you look. All right? So let's get Leviticus 19, 17. Let's go into the Torah, right? Let's go into the law on what it means to love your brother, to love your neighbor, right? Leviticus 19, 17. It says, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. It's very clear, right? If I love my brother, I'm not going to suffer sin upon my neighbor. I'm not going to let my brother have that cigarette in his hand, right? We're not going to allow that to happen. Hey, bro, put this. Now it's, it's up to you to keep smoking that cigarette after I tell you it's a sin. After I tell you you're defiling your temple, right? If we call ourselves a temple of God, how are you going to defile the temple by putting carcinogens and smoke in your lungs, Right? How am I going to tell my brother I love him and allow him to wake up and, and not thank the most high, not pray to the most high, right? But play the video game and set up idols in, in, in front instead of the most high. That's what our people do. We set up idols instead of having up the most high, right? We get up, wake up, we play Madden. We get up, we play damn 2K. Is anybody getting up and thanking the most high that you lived? Because you could have been dead. Some, like we said, some brothers didn't go to sleep last night and some people didn't wake up today, right? So it says, and not suffer sin upon him. I can't allow you to sin if I love you, brother, if I love you, sister. But don't take it as me hating on you. Don't take it as uh, uh, my correction as uh, only God can judge me. The Most High sent the men out there to correct the people. Verse 18, Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Yahweh, right? So love for my brother is telling him what it is, right? Love is correcting him on his misinterpretation on the scriptures. Love is telling him, hey, put the pork out, right? You got Sometimes you got to tell grandma, hey, no pork, no shrimp. No chitlins on Thanksgiving. And that's what our people are into. Watch this. All right, let's get 1 John 3, verse 15. And this is all we're doing. This is not a real deep breakdown. There's no real dark sayings on here. Sometimes feeding our people the milk is probably the more uh, uh, effective way of teaching. Sometimes teaching our people the milk, right, is the more effective way. Yeah, we can go into the market of beasts. Yeah, we can go into karagma. We can go into uh, uh, certain doctrines, right? We can go into the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But sometimes just telling our brothers and sisters what love is, 
makes our movement more clear, right? So this is 1 John 3, verse 15. And it reads, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him, right? So anybody that uh, hates his brother, and how do you hate your brother? You hate your brother by letting him sin, allowing him to sin, right? Passing him the blunt. Well, I'm not, you know, brothers is, you know, trying to play the fence. Well, I'll roll you the blunt, but I'm not going to smoke it, right? You got brothers that's in the truth that will, that will try to toe the line, right? Try to play the fence. Well, I will, I'll roll the blunt. Because I used to roll good blunts. I used to roll them tight, right? Brothers be saying, I used to roll the blunts tight, right? But I'm not going to smoke it because I'm an Israelite. No, no, you don't roll the blunt. Don't roll the blunt, right? Don't buy the weed for him. Don't give him the lighter. Do not suffer your brother to sin, right? Because if I allow you to sin by rolling that blunt, right? If I, if, if I, uh, uh, allow you to break the Sabbath, right? Then I I hate my brother. If I hate my brother, then I'm a murderer. That's what Yahweh Shai said, right? Uh, uh, Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we love the Most High because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. And how do you lay your life down for your brother? It don't always mean run in front of us a bullet. It don't always mean something like that. Sometimes you got to allow yourself to be the laughing stock, right? Sometimes, yeah, hey, take a joke. Oh, this, oh, this nigga corny now. Oh, this nigga no longer in the, uh, uh, in the streets no more. He in the truth now, right? You got to wear that burden, man. That's what it means, right? Um, laying down your life, being a, being a fool for Christ's sake, right? Um, now look at verse 17, but whoso hate, hate, Salakia, let me read it again. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So if I shut up the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, right? And I don't open my full hand and give him this information and I'm kind of hiding things from him then that's not really love, right? Love is this. This is love, right? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word. We're not loving in word. Don't be out there telling everybody that you love him. Don't tell every sister you love her, sis, right? Neither in tongue, right? We're not gonna, listen, the Christian church and Esau's uh, uh, so-called mindset is to use words to create a narrative. This is how they put a white Messiah in front of us. This is how they told us different doctrines that don't coincide with this Bible, right? Because they use words to show love, but it's never in action. Now look at this. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, which is speech. Brothers are saying, I love you all the time, but in deed and in truth, right? That's heavy right there. That's heavy right there. A lot of times our sisters find themselves in, in relationships, in marriages because of tongue and in word. But they never uh, uh, filtered out that man's actions. Right? I think a lot of times our women will find themselves avoiding certain relationships that are toxic if they didn't go by the words of that brother, but by his actions and his deeds. The same thing for the men, right? The men fall for the, the love of a woman's words, right? She tells you she loves you, right? But what is her action saying? What is her deed saying? A lot of times we can sideswipe negative relationships, right? We can sideswipe and avoid negative Toxic relationships that are take that's taken years off our life. If we just use this Bible, right, as a guide. Look at this. John 15, 13. 
Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Right? It's Yahweh right? Yahweh is saying that a man laid down his life for his friends. Right? And that's heavy right there. That's heavy because the Torah tells us to lay down our life for our brothers and our sisters, man. Look what Moses did. Moses had Pharaoh's kingdom at his fingertips. But he had to smite an Egyptian because that Egyptian was abusing his own brother. And he gave up all the riches of Egypt for the love of his brother. He killed an Egyptian, right? And as a result, he had to flee Egypt. He had to flee the ways of uh, uh, the heathen because he knew he had love for his brother, right? But we don't do that. Our people don't do that. Our people rather um, give what the Most High has given us to everybody else, right? Now everybody's your neighbor. Now the Moabite's your neighbor, right? Now the damn Hamite is your neighbor. Now Esau is your, is your neighbor, right? How was I said, Matthew, let me get Matthew 7 and 6. I won't be long, right? I won't be long. Matthew 7 and 6. A lot of times our people give away so much, man. We gave away our heritage, our language, our laws, our customs, our nationality. We gave up our God. We gave up our salvation. Look at Matthew 7 and 6. It says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. So what are the things that are holy? Again, you being an Israelite and understanding who you are in 2022, that is what, that's holy. That allows you, right, to, to move this life differently. When you find out you're an Israelite, you're going to move differently in life. There's no way you can, you can't, right? You're going to, you're going to move. You're going to look different. You're going to talk different. You're going to respond to people differently, right? So give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. And that's exactly what happened. Syrac 12 and 10 also goes into that. Never trust your enemy, Right? And it tells you later on in Syrac 12 and 10 in the Apocrypha, right? That when you do that, he's going to, you're going to set, you're going to set yourself. Matter of fact, let's just get it, right? Let's just get it. I'm going to get right to the point, all right? Because we know Syrac 12 and 10. That's a classic right here, right? Never trust your enemy so for like it's iron rusted. But look what it says. Uh, uh, verse 12, set him not by thee, lest when he hath overthrown thee, he stand up in thy place. So when you cast your pearls to the swine, right, and, and you give what's holy to the dogs, they're going to then call themselves Israelites. They're going to call themselves the real Jews, right? And that's exactly what happened, right? We gave what was holy to the so-called heathen, man, right? Say them not by thee, lest when he hath overthrown thee, which is what happened, right? Now, when you go to Matthew 7 and 6, it says, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you, right? So that's basically parallel to what Syrac 12 and 12 says. When he hath overthrown thee, he stand up in thy place. Now he can call himself a Jew. Now he can call himself a Levite, right? Or Judah, right? He's a Judah. He's from the tribe of Judah, <laughs> right? Which is funny to me, man. Neither let him sit at thy right hand, lest he seek to take thy seat. And thou at the last remember my words and be pricked therewith, right? And that's what you see a lot of these uh, Christian uh, Israelites, right? They, they have this new doctrine where they want to in, include everybody, right? And then now it kind of bit them in the, in the, in the, in the rear end, man, uh, <laughs> right? When, uh, you know, when Becky can go around and, and talk about our forefathers and foremothers, living in the oceans and, and, and being thrown overboard and being eaten by sharks, man, right? That's literally just happened this week. And you see people having the answer for that that allowed her to be a part of their crew. When they overthrow you by usurping themselves above you, you at the bottom and at the top. Now look at us today. This is Exodus 3, verse 7. And the Most High said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Right? So this is us being in bondage in Egypt, right? Our so-called, our first captivity, like literally our first captivity. 
and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. This is our salvation, right? And to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. So you want to go into salvation? You want to know what salvation is? Right? Salvation is literally being delivered from the hands of our oppressors. Right? The oppressors, right? The people that afflict pain on us. The taskmasters that give us, uh, uh, that, that put us under slavery. Right? Verse 10. Come now. And it's talking about Israelites. It's not talking about all people. So this salvation that the Christian church tells you is not biblically sound. Because what are you being saved from in the Christian church? Right? They'll tell you it's the pits of hell. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible literally equates salvation from the people that afflict pain on his children, the so-called black, Hispanic, and Native Americans, the Israelites, right? Look at verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And modern-day Pharaoh is your Joe Bidens. Modern-day Pharaoh is the kings of the earth. Right, that afflict pain on the people, that kill our people, that hunt our steps. This is what we need salvation from. All right, let's get Luke one sixty eight. Let's go into the New Testament. Right. All right, this is the book of Luke, chapter one, verse sixty eight. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people. Right, redeemed His people, meaning bringing back His people. When you go to Deuteronomy 28, 68, it says no man shall buy you. And that word buy is redeem because we've had guys before try to redeem us out of our affliction. That didn't work, right? Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all these guys tried to redeem the people of Israel. Only one redeemer is going to come and that's Yahweh Shai, right? So let me read it again. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is John the Baptist's father prophesying about Yahweh Shai coming for he hath visited and redeemed his people and have raised up a horn of salvation, right? Salvation, which is what sa save comes from, for us in the house of his servant David, from the family, the lineage of David, right? As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, you see all through like Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah, right? You talk about uh, 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 the prophets prophesying about Yahweh Shah. Right. Isaiah seven, Isaiah 53. Uh, uh, it, it goes on and on. Right. Which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Right. So when we go into what salvation is, we just had two witnesses right there. Old Testament, New Testament. And it says the same thing. Right. That we that Israel salvation is for Israel being uh, saved from the oppressor and the enemy, right? Sometimes when we go into debates, we go into conversations and dialogues about people talking about salvation. They have this mindset of salvation literally being in the kingdom, right? And and when you're talking about uh, being in the kingdom, uh, uh, how would you say this, right? It's not, I'm not saying being in the kingdom is not salvation, right? But when it comes to being saved here on, 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 on um, here right now, it's always been uh, 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 parallel and it's always merged with Israelites being saved from the oppressors, from those that hate them, that kill us, right? And put our people in bondage and captivity, right? So you have to establish salvation before you even talk about other nations being in the kingdom, Right? Of course, other nations will be in the kingdom. Somebody got to build the desolate places. Somebody got to rebuild our kingdom that they destroyed, right? Somebody got to be servants and handmaids. Um, this is Psalms 44 and 7. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and has put them to shame that hated us, right? So so um, what, what it's saying right here, right? 
Let me, let me read verse 6. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. So the Most High is only going to save us when it's time. We can't go out there and try to fight for our salvation, right? No camp is out there saying, take up arms right now and let's go out there and, and use weaponry, right, to, 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 to win this so-called spiritual warfare against our enemies. We're not going to trust in Bo, right? We're going to trust in Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai. That's why it says, but thou hast saved us. Who was the thou? Yahweh, right? From our enemies. So salvation, again, is from our enemies. We have physical enemies. Go to Psalm 83, and it tells you who Israel's enemies is. And has put them to shame that hated us. It's not talking about some man underground with a red pitchfork, right? Let me get Baruch 4 and 28, right? Let me get Baruch, the fourth chapter, the 28th verse, all right? This is Baruch 4 and 28. It says, for as it was your mind to go astray from God, so being returned, seek him ten times more, for he hath brought these plagues upon you. So like it, for he that hath brought these plagues upon you shall bring you everlasting joy again with your salvation. Take a good heart, O Jerusalem, for he, hath, for he that gave thee that name will comfort thee. Right? So uh, when you understand that, right? Take a good heart, O Jerusalem, for he that gave thee, that name will comfort thee, right? And then it, again, it says, verse 29, for he that hath brought these, brought these plagues upon you shall bring you everlasting joy with your salvation. So all these other nations that has put us through uh, uh, slavery, turmoil, literal and physical hell, it's going to come back on them, right? It's going to come back on them. And you're going to, and you see that now, right? We actually see, uh, when you go out there and you driving around and you, you know, at these red lights, you're seeing more and more Edomites begging for money, right? You're seeing more and more other nations that's on these certain, uh, drugs, man, these fentanyls and your, and your meths or whatnot. You're seeing them, um, you know, uh, they're, they're using that, those drugs and they're, they're living in these bushes, right? Especially out here in Raleigh, man, you know, they have like, um, something called, uh, what is it called? It's, um, uh, I want to say, um, meth camps. It's a meth camp where people just, you know, they, 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 they go out there, they take shifts on the streets and they try to, uh, they try to make money begging for, you know, a couple dollars or whatnot. And they use that money to go buy meth. And then, but they don't just use the meth on the street. They actually hide in these bushes and it'd be a bunch of them and they all shooting up heroin. They all shooting up meth. Right? Meth camps, man. Look it up. This is Ezekiel 38 and 10. All right? I don't want to get into that, right? Because the heathen going to do what the heathen going to do. Right? We got to understand what's at stake for your salvation and what it actually means. Ezekiel 38 and 10. All right? It says, Thus said the Lord God, It shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. This is talking about Gog and Magog, right? Gog, Magog. All right? Um, let's read on verse 11 and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, understanding what walls mean, walls are hedges of protection. When you understand walls, they are your hedge and Israel's hedge of protection. And uh, it says unwalled villages, but us being at rest from our oppressors, our enemies, we're finally going to be at rest. But what 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 Gog is saying is, hey, they don't have any um, they don't have any protection. So let's go up there and try to take them over. Watch this to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, right? So they were once desolate. Now it's going to be inhabited, right? By who? Israelites, right? And upon that, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. So us being gathered out of these other nations and going into the land and, and not having a, a so-called uh, fortress, a physical fortress up, right? It's almost like a trap. 
you know, Gog is thinking, hey, they don't have nobody there. But we do. We do have somebody there. It might not be a wall, but it's the most high, right? It says, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away the cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Right? We look vulnerable. That's what it's saying. We're going to look vulnerable to these other nations. We're going to look vulnerable like we don't have actual help, but we do, man. Right? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God, thus said the Lord God in that day, when, the, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, right? So, so we're going to, we're going to have people coming, trying to take us over, trying to take over the land, right? Trying to, trying to put us back in captivity, but this is us out of, uh, uh, the captivity of America's and us in all nations. This is us coming out and we're going to be at rest. We're going to be dwelling safely, but it's not going to look like it. That's what it's saying. And a great army is going to try to come and overtake us. Verse 16, and that shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, said the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. You see that? So God and all these other, you know, this, this, this company of armies are going to try to attack us and the Most High is going to redeem us. The Most High is going to fight that battle for us, right? He's going to ultimately win. He's ultimately going to win. So that's another form of salvation. But we, as a people, we want to give that to everybody, right? And everybody who <laughs> wouldn't give that back to us, right? As a nation of Israel, man, we are so giving as a people, man. We are so uh, uh, happy to just go out there and just be um, uh, kumbaya, you know, everybody, one, come one, come all. That's our mindset. Right? We're casting our pearls for the swine. We give away our salvation. All right, let's get Revelation 12 and 7. All right, I won't be long. I got a few more and I'm going to wrap it up. This is Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Who's the dragon? Esau, right? The so called white man, right? That's the dragon and his armies and all these hosts of armies, right? So let's read it again. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. So there's actual battles, right? And prevailed not. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. Right? So it's a, it's a good fight. It's going to be a good fight, man. Right? And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Right. So those angels in that in that in that in the so-called white man, that dragon. Right. Even though he got nukes and he's got all kind of uh, in the kind of ballistic missiles and all that. He's ultimately going to be cast out. I mean, he's going to fall down in a lower state. He's going to be defeated. Right. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. So before we get salvation, these other nations must be defeated first, right? You can't have salvation and still be in oppression, right? It don't work like that. As a nation of people, we can't have salvation and still be oppressed. You can't have salvation and still be uh, uh, rele relegated as three-fifths of a human by your oppressor. And our Christian church, they love to say, I'm saved. I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, right? 
Hamashiach said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So either you're going to stand this truth to the day you die, right? And keep the commandments to the, and have the faith, right? To the day you die. Or if you're able to see what's going on right here and, and you're able to witness that, now is come salvation. Let me read it again. And I heard verse 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his anointed or his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Right. So who accuses the so-called black, Hispanic, Native American man? Right. And, if, and who accuses actually the whole world? Right. Who goes into damn Gren Grenada? Who goes into damn Iraq? Who goes into Australia, right? And accuses the people. I'm not saying that these different nations I named were Israelites, but the, the damn dragon, right? Esau, right? The damn white man, he, 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 he's at this point now where he don't care who you are. You could be Israel. You could be these other nations. He's going to exalt himself as the king of this earth, right? Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, which is Hamashiach Yahweh and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death, right? So you see salvation, again, is synonymous with other nations in this particular context, the so-called white man, the so-called uh, uh, damn Edomite, right? The, the Edomite, not so-called, the Edomite, right? That damn devil right, has to be destroyed before we can get salvation. Stop going around saying I'm saved, right? And notice it says, by the blood of the lamb. The lamb is being Yahweh Shai, right? Yahweh Shai. Well, what does Yahweh Shai mean? Let's get Matthew 121, right? Let's get Matthew 121, because there's power in the name, right? And Yahweh Shai's name, right, literally means salvation, right? Like his name literally means the savior, but it's the savior of Yahshua Allah. Let's prove it. This is Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. It says Jesus, but we know it in the Hebrew as Yahweh Shai. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, Zechariah, right? John the Baptist's father told you. The prophecy of Yahweh Shai Mashiach was that uh, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he shall save his people from their sins, right? Raise up a horn of salvation. The prophecy of Yahweh Shai is about salvation, right? Yahweh Shai's name means he is salvation. He is a savior. He is a, 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 a salvation redeemer, right? So let me read it again. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahweh Shai, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the name. That's his name right there, playing upon tables. Right? And who was he saving? His people. They don't say everybody. His people. Well, who was his people? The so-called Black, Hispanic, Native American. We got to stop being so easily persuaded to throw away um, our salvation and just give it to all nations. We got to be so, we can't be so quick to just give away the things, right? Because now, now you actually take on a spirit of Esau, right? Because Esau served his birthright for nothing and tried to get it back, but, could, but couldn't, right? So when we go out there and we do these things, right? Yeah, everybody can get salvation. Everybody's, everybody can be saved uh, and everybody can be co-heirs in the kingdom of heaven. You, you're actually giving away Right. You're actually giving away the things that was given to you by birthright. You are giving away your birthright to other nations, just like Esau gave away his birthright uh, for for beans and rice and lentils and stuff. Right. And, and that's another thing I want to get into. Right. The, the idea on what our own people believe getting into the kingdom of heaven looks like. Right. So let's get Matthew. I got two more. Matthew 7 and 21. This is Yahavashai. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is what your grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, all the indoctrinated Christians will, will qualify as salvation. 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Right? The will of the Father, Psalm 40 and 8, is the law. Right? Let's get it real quick. Psalm 40 and 8 gives you the definition of God's will. Right? It, 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 you know, precept must be upon precept, line upon line. Right? So it says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Right? So the law is the will. And in Christ, Hamashiach is going to further uh, substantiate that. Right? It says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. The Christian church does many wonderful works. I'm not going to poo-poo on that, right? When they go into these uh, uh, food drives and they give away school uh, children for the schools and things like that, for the kids, books and pencils and backpacks. Yeah, we need that. These are many wonderful works, right? The Christian church does that. Great for them, right? I, we, we, need to, we need to take a page from that and, and do things for the young kids, man. Do things for the for the for the widow, right? Charity, right? Give away food, give away um, school supplies, right? That that's something that I wish we can do, but that's not what's going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. It looks good, feels good, but it's not what qualifies. It's not the qualifying factor, right? Verse twenty three, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity, right? Iniquity is sin. Iniquity is sin. Let me get Psalm 6 and 8 real quick. Said I was going to do two more. I, you know, I, my Salakia, right? Salakia. All right, Psalm 6 and 8. It says, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity of the Lord. For the Lord, Salakia, let me read it again. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity of the Lord. For the Lord have heard the voice of my weeping, right? So again, again, iniquity is sin, right? So Hamashiach is, is quoting Psalm 6 and 8, right? I never knew you. Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity. All you that, you know, don't keep the feast days, don't keep the Sabbath days. You don't have your tent for the tabernacle. You think, oh, Christ is my tabernacle, I keep the law through Christ. That whatever that whatever the hell that means, right? You're not doing the, you're not doing the works. Again, love is actually in deed and in action. It's not in tongue and in word. Don't say, "Oh, I keep the law through Christ." Don't say that, right? Because you're not. You're not. Paul, Peter, and the apostles and the disciples, after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, still followed through and kept the physical laws, right? They still took Nazarite vows. They still kept the Passover physically, went to Jerusalem physically and kept the Passover, right? Somehow, some way, our Christian church thinks I can keep the law just by believing Hamashiach and Hawashai, and that doesn't work, right? So what, what, what's, what's the main objective, right? Let's get Acts 3 and 19. We're going to end it right here, right? Acts 3 and 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's it. Repent and be converted. How do you be converted? You got to, again, Psalm, we can go to Psalm 119, right? Where it says, I thought of my ways. What's that? Psalm 119, verse 57. I thought of my ways, right? That's what it means to be converted. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Right, Psalm, hold up, Psalm 119, verse uh, 59. I thought of my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Right, so that's the conversion part, all right? So with that, man, hopefully it was edifying. I was able to uh, get it under an hour. All praise to the Most High, all right? Go over these precepts, all right? Go over these scriptures, meditate on there. Uh, leave a comment in the uh, chat if, 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 you know, if you feel any way around it, man. Hey, I'm all for it. I uh, love y'all, Israel, and I, I love y'all because I tell y'all the truth. I love y'all because I tell my people how to keep God's laws, statutes, and commandments and to put away from sin, right? Subscribe, like, share the channel, share the video, man. Uh, all praise to the Most High. 
All praises to the brothers in Yahweh's camp, man. All praises to the elders in Yahweh's camp that's teaching us this truth and sincerity. Uh, all praises to the elders in the martial art, Yasha'ala, and all the camps that's out there doing the work, man. Love y'all, brothers, man. Y'all stay doing the work. Uh, matter of fact, let me just get one more, right? I love this scripture right here. I want to get Revelation. In a nutshell, this is what we do. Revelation uh, 14 and 12, all right? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, right? Patience, faith, right? So endurance, which is patience, having the faith and keeping the commandments. With that, I say Shalom.